So today, we're going to start talking about samplers. Now, what a sampler is, is it's just another synthesizer. Uh, the difference is that instead of using an oscillator for the sounds, it uses a recorded piece of audio. So instead of generating a, a sawtooth wave, it just plays a wave file. But then you do all the same things with it. You, you can pitch it up and down, uh, filter it, you know, you can throw an envelope on it, you know, all those same kinds of things you do with the synthesizer, you do with a sampler, it's just the thing you start with is different. You're starting with an actual audio recording. The idea here originally was, while theoretically you should be able to create the sound of anything with a synthesizer, should be able to, in practice, you know, it's tough to, it's really easy to make, you know, fake sounds with a synthesizer, things that don't exist in real life. But it's harder to get a synthesizer to sound like something that actually exists, right? To make a synthesizer sound like an actual violin is hard. Um, and so, uh, eventually, once you know we were able to do digital recording and playback in a way that you know you could put that into a piece of hardware and use it, that was kind of the next step. It was like, well, instead of trying to make a cheesy synthesizer sound of a violin, we could actually just record a violin. You know, record the sound of a violin playing notes and then put that into a digital instrument and then play that. Right? And then we could play to perform other things, right? As long as we had the notes, we could then just load that onto a keyboard and play it. So that's the idea behind a sampler is a sampler is using an actual recording of the real thing. Uh, and it's just manipulating it to try to get something else. So that's what that's what we're doing. Uh, to do that, you have, obviously have to start with a recording of a real thing, and this is going to be a, a, an assignment that I'm going to give you uh, to work on. Is this where we create our own plugins? You, you're gonna, yeah, you're going to create your own sampler instrument. Yes. Okay, so you need to think of an instrument, a musical instrument, that you either play yourself or have access to someone who plays. Um, it could be anything. Does it have to be an instrument? Yes. Something, some sort of pitched musical instrument. No, it needs to be a, a musical instrument that plays notes, pitched notes. Okay, so no drums, right? It has to be something something that you could play a melody with. Okay, yeah, that'd be fine. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, there are a few few hundred people on this campus that play musical instruments. Um, you know, you might even have one that's a roommate or something. Uh, so if you play something, that's great. If you don't, find somebody who does or get something simple. I mean, you know, just like a recorder. I mean, that's what I'm going to do today as a recorder. You all learned how to play that in like third grade. So they can teach us recorder. When I got into fourth grade, it was the year that they stopped paying for this. But you could teach yourself. Recorder is easy to learn. Uh, you don't even have to know how to play it. You just have to like look up the note, the whole thing, so you know what holes to cover okay. up, and you just need a recorder. Kind of like Doggy Island. Yeah. Ten-year-olds need to learn every Disney classic. So yeah. what, what notes do you, you just need one note? Yeah. So what'll happen is you you could, it's the simplest of patches would just have one note, like middle C or something, whatever is the middle range of the instrument. And then the sample will pitch it up or down from there. But you'll you find that after it's pitched it by three or four semitones, it starts to distort a little bit. Um, and so it's better if you can have several different notes that you just span ranges of keys with. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do. So um, start thinking about an instrument you can do. Is again, it, you, don't, you don't even have to play, be able to play it. I mean, if you just wanted to go borrow somebody's instrument, all you have to be able to do is, is play like seven notes on it. You don't have to play a song. You just have to know, well, how do I play a C? It's a guitar or you know whatever. That's all you got to be able to do. And then you can, because ultimately the whole point is you don't know how to play this, so you're going to put it in a computer and so you can play it on the keyboard. Right? That's what you're trying to do. All right. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today is how to prepare those samples. So once, you're gonna, once you record them, how do you prepare them for a sampler? And if we get far enough to actually load them into sample today, I'll show you. If not, we'll do that on Monday. Um, but a week from Friday is when I want you to turn in your sampler instrument. Okay? So you basically have two weeks? Yeah. How many more projects are there? Is it this in the store board? Story? Yes. Um, so uh, what you'll do is sometime between now and 
and week from Friday is you'll, you'll need to go into the studio at DMP and record this instrument. Okay, and we're, you're going to do that on your own. That's not we're not going to do that together. Okay, so you'll need to find time to do that. Okay, uh, and if you need to need help getting into this studio, I can help you with that. All right, so uh, we're going to go back to our old friend Triumph to do this. You have you do this in a sample editor, not a workstation program like Logic. Okay, so hey Jim, right. so. Uh, I have this recording that I did. You would probably record it in Logic, right? Just because Triumph doesn't record. So you go ahead and record your instrument in Logic, but then you just bounce out the file, and then you're going to edit it in Triumph because it, the samplers want certain kinds of metadata that tr that Logic has a harder time embedding into it. You bounce out as what? Just a WAV file or an AIF, just something. You'll see. So here it is. Here's my... Uh, my little recording session I did of me playing my daughter's recorder. Recorder. Low, Low C. C. Low C, 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 C take two. two. <laughs> Low, Low C, C take three. three. Yes, I got it. <laughs> so I'm just slating all of these so I know which is which. So let's see, what was that one? A. C. Don't quite hold that one very well. And now I'm going to try the hard way. E. I e take two. I e take three. There you go. All right. So I, I played the lowest note that I could play and the highest note I could play and a few in between. Okay. Uh, and I just had the little hole chart there in front of me, so I knew which one that would holes to cover and did it until I got the right sound. Okay. So this first one, so I'll just show you how I'm going to prep these. Low C, take three. So this is my low C. So I'm just going to select that. And let's see if I can believe I can. I think there's an action that will copy selected. New workspace from selected range. That's what I'm going to do. New workspace from selected range. That's just going to make a new workspace with just this little note. Okay. There we go. And this is going to be my what was it? Low C, take three. Low C. So this will be my low C. All right. So here's what I want to do. I need to I need to tighten this up quite a bit. So I'm going to get rid of the top of this because you want as little gap as possible because you want to be able, when you hit the key, you want it to come in instantly. Okay, so you want to tighten this gap as much as you can without chopping off the good stuff. So you may have to zoom in a bit to get there and probably the tightest I'd feel comfortable being is like right about there. Okay, and that's when it starts coming in. Okay. Somebody just undo and <laughs> no I mean why not for instantaneous on oh uh, well it'll you'll it depends on what you're going to do with it later so if you're going to put an a, a artificial envelope on it in the sampler and do a fade in then yeah chop it off um, in my in this case I'm interested in that that sound of it coming in so you know, I don't know, we'll try it and see how it goes. Later, you know, you can fudge that in the sampler later. Okay, so once you put it in there, you can actually tell it. Start it, go ahead and start into this a little bit later, instead of right at the beginning. Um, so, you, but you can't tell it to make up something that isn't there. All right, so I, I always prefer to start there, and then if I nudge it if I need to. Um, okay, now what I need is a loop, because I might want to hold this note longer than I'm playing it. Okay. 
Um, and so I'm going to go to my labels here, and I'm going to drag a loop. And this is the blue marker loop. I'll just drag it in here. And what you're looking for here is a range that loops seamlessly. You go under the, your labels here, and there's a loop. And you just drag that onto the editor. And I need to put this into the into playback mode. So if I hit this little marker button up here, I want to say loop selection. Okay, so that I can or actually loop content, I think is what I want. Yeah, there we go. So I need to find a loop that works. And I'm actually pretty close already. You want to look for a range that is similar in amplitude all the way across. So maybe I'll back up here. But you also you don't want it to be too long either. And you're looking at this overlap here so that the pattern is consistent. That's not bad actually. Every once in a while I get a little click, but it doesn't seem consistent. There we go. I think that's good. Okay, so um, if that's where my loop's going to be, then I really don't need all this other stuff at the end here. Okay, so I'm just going to get rid of that. Um, <coughs> yeah, in fact, you know, it depends on the instrument. You may want that little tail off the end. Um, and if you do, then you've got to figure out another little edit to where you can chop that off and have that butt against your loop to where it sounds good. Um, in this case, I'm not going to worry too much about it. I'm going to do a little envelope that kind of does, fades it out real quick. Um, so I'm, I don't know, I'm torn on that. I mean, like, how much time it takes you to get out of the, out of the loop? Yeah, because you can do that. You can say, you know, when I get out of the loop, go ahead and play to the end. Um, and I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to, do a little splice here, and I'll make it work. So I'm going to take this, because I'm, maybe I want that. And what I'll do is I'll overlap these a little bit. Okay, I'm going to overlap them a little bit, and kind of engineer a little crossfade here. Let's see how that sounds. I'm going to put the thing into manual mode. Uh, let's see. Don't loop, please. I can't really tell. I need to disable my loop. Turn off. There we go. Okay, so if I go back to the beginning here. I could look at that, I think. Could be a little bit better. But it's not horrible. Let's see what I'm doing here. Let me just back some of this off. If I had to, I could move it. It's still giving me a little bit of a boost there that I don't want. Jumping. 
Uh, I'll take that. I'll take that one. All right, that'll work. All right, let me turn my loop back on here. There we go. So now, so if I needed to, I could dump out and get the end of that note. All right. So now what I can do is uh, I'll go ahead and render this. Uh, let's see. Render workspace. And I want a WAV file. I believe these are 24-bit sources, so I'll go ahead and keep that. Same sampling rate. And we'll call this low C. And I'm going to save this to a little folder, which I believe is. So what did you do in here that you there? Those loop points. All right, I'm going to create a custom action for that and render it. There you go. So now I've got that, that file. There's my low C wave file. Yeah, so logic won't bounce out those, mar those loop markers. So that, that's why you've got to do it in, in something like this. I don't understand loop markers. You mean just like digital numbers? Yeah, this, this, these two markers that tell when the loop starts and when the loop ends. It won't bounce out loop markers, though. It'll bounce out marker markers, but not loop markers. So it just won't. This, what's reading these markers? The sampler. This is a specific piece of metadata that the sampler is looking for that you're having to embed here. So there's a difference between loop marker and regular marker? Yep. Yep. There's other things you can do, too. Um, you can go in and tag this with other metadata such as you know what is the the MIDI note here so like let's see um, it's not on here MIDI bass note which would you know you could actually put a little tag on there that says this is the frequency that this thing is and the sampler will read that in um, I prefer to add that all in manually myself later. Um, that's just me. Uh, so, all right, we're going to do another one here. Uh, when, when you uh, talk about that tags, mm -hmm. you put in a frequency that's different from what you're actually trying to change. Yeah. That's what I want to know. So you have to know, you know, that C is uh, 131.3. Well, no. The sampler doesn't think about it in terms of frequency. It just thinks about it in terms of what is the note and how much am I pitching it from there. Okay. So what we ultimately have to do later is we have to tune these together because I'm, I played this and it was horrible and they were all out of tune. So I'm going to have to tune these against each other later in the sampler. And I'll show you how to do that when we get to that part. But it's really what you need to know is what is the note. And I, so I just make sure I at least label the name with the note name so I know that this is a C, right? And then when I put it in, I know that that's what it is. And I can figure out later what I'm going to do with it. So, this is the E. So I'll go ahead and get that one. So I want a new workspace from selection range. This is my low E. So same deal. All right, I need to kind of edit this down a bit. Do it back there, we'll see how that sounds. Okay, now let's find a loop, shall we? <coughs> a little pulse to it, doesn't it? Get rid of that 
So uh, what I'm doing is this little this little arrow is the zero slash. Um, what that's going to do is it's going to nudge it to the next zero cross point. Okay, so the next place where the wave crosses the zero line, that's where it won't make a pop. If you line it up so that the beginning and end of the loop line up at a zero point, then there will be no pop. It makes a pop when one of them is like up at the top and one of them's at the bottom, and it makes a square wave pop. So that's what I, these little arrows with the phase thing on it. That's I'm nudging it by zero cross points. So I don't have a pop there, but I do have a little bit of a pulse. You hear that pulse to it? I'm not sure I really like. Lengthen this out a little bit. Tuning there a little bit, isn't it? In my crappy playing. That's close. I'm gonna lengthen it just a bit more. And that's dipping now, isn't it? It looks really even over here. I got better towards the end. <laughs> That's better. I'm gonna take. Oh, I'm gonna take that. Okay. So. Uh, <clears throat> And now I'll, I'm going to have to fudge my little, because uh, I don't want that much lead in on it before I get to the thing. So let me go ahead and do a splice there. And we'll do a little cheat. You always overlap. You never try to match your purpose. It's tricky. It's really tricky to do. I usually do a crossfade. Yeah. Both in the top and bottom are adjustable. The top is what does a fade. Okay. The bottom is what does an edit. Yeah. Gotcha. Let me try that. It's just a weird way to look at it. Because it looks like as you're moving that top point, it looks like you're increasing. You see what I'm saying? It looks like you're. Yeah, so this does a fade, whereas this actually moves the cut. That would sound like. Oh, that pad, that's awful. I think I might. I might be willing to live with that. Pulse still, doesn't it? Let's see if I can smooth it out just a bit. All right, I'll take it. It's not perfect, but it's good enough. Uh, maybe I'll, should I try and do this too? Why not?
get the end of this guy too. Let's turn off my loop for a second and see what we have. I'll take it. <laughs> I'm not going to mess with it anymore. All right, so we're going to call that one good. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take all of this now. Oops. Let's see if I can. Hopefully the loop will move with me. No. Crud, how do I get the loop to move? It won't, I bet. All right. Well, well, the loop is just different from the regions, which is sort of the point. So I'll just have to snag it again. <laughs> I'll get it. I know where it was. Okay, I uh, better save this while I'm sitting here working on it. Uh, Just for argument's sake, they both have to be at the zero point. They both can't be just at the same identical point in the wave. Like they they could be, but that's even trickier. <laughs> it's much easier to do it at a zero cross. Okay, uh, let's see. I got three more to do here. So we'll do this one, which is what? A. All right, this is the A. So new workspace from selection range. This will be my A. I'm going to be smarter this time and trim it before. I can tell you right now, my loop point's going to be here because that's where it's the most even. OK, so I'm going to go ahead and keep that. We'll splice this. To do what? Oh, uh, when you pick new workspace, where'd you get it from? Oh, from so I just made a. I had my first one, and I just selected the thing I wanted, and then there's an action, action. here that goes edit, right. new workspace from selection range, yeah. and that just lets me drill into the thing I'm looking for. All right, this is a particularly nasty performance on this one. We'll see. That's fine. I'll take it. All right. So now I got to, let's see, while I'm here, I'll move this whole thing. Well, let me trim this. Oops, not all of that. Trim this up to the beginning of it and then drag the whole thing. There. All right, now I got to find my loop. So I'll drag a loop out there. See if we can find a good one. You what? Do we have to pick an instrument that sustains? No. On Monday I'm gonna show you one that doesn't. 
On Monday, I'm gonna, we're going to do a guitar. So should we wait until... If it doesn't sustain, then you just don't have to do loops. Okay. You still have to split them all up and dump them out, but you don't have to do loops. But you should... Do, you should don't be afraid of the loops. Looping is, the, is sort of the point of sampling. It's like one of the cool things about it. Um, as you'll see when we do the storybook project. So if you know, if you don't bother to learn how to do a loop, you're going to eventually learn how to do it when you do the storybook. Okay, so so don't just because this looks annoying, don't avoid it because you're going to have to do it eventually. Close. <laughs> I thought I was close. It helps if you have a better player than me. I'll take it. <laughs> All right. And Let's see if I can go ahead and trim some of this. Uh, that, maybe something like that, something like that. And turn off my loop for a moment. my loop back on. Okay, there we go. I have my A. Did I, I don't think I rendered my E, did I? No, I didn't. Um, render. There we go. Did that work? I thought I made, it one, made one for that, maybe not. 24 bit, 48, 22, that would be low E. Okay. Did I get it? Yes. Okay, so now I'll do the A under workspace. Do, do, do. And there's my A. All right, I got two more to go, and then we can start making music. Quarter A C. Oh, this will be a particularly nasty one, I can tell already. <laughs> so this is my C, my middle C, if you will. Oh, look at it. look how awful that is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get rid of some of this nastiness here at the beginning. Get to the good stuff. And we'll do a really long fade up. <laughs> Let's see if we can make a loop on this one. Yeah. 
feel like I'm close. I don't know. This is, uh, yeah, I don't know. Could be a could be a problem with Triumph, the way it's handling it. But you're right. In theory, if it works once, it should work all the time. Yeah. It's probably a result of some sort of uh, bit depth conversion that's happening on the fly or something. That 64-bit to 24 conversion. That'd be my guess. It sounds great except for those two. Yeah, every once in a while I get a weird one. I'd like to get them. It was a bit more consistent, though. Let's see. I feel like that's kind of that's got to work. It should have been. It looks, it looks like it should work perfect. Yeah, I think it's going to be fine. Okay. The other times where this can get tricky is if you've got like if it's like a stereo file or something. Um, the zero cross points won't line up on both channels, yeah. right? So what might work for the left won't work for the right. So it gets trickier. Um, yeah. All right, I'm going to call that one good. It may not be perfect, but we'll see. We'll find out later. I'm saving this workspace, so if I need to go back and tweak it later, I can. When you say saving your workspace, is that different than just saving logic, the Triumph that you're working with? Yeah, the Triumph workspace. So I'm not, you know, I'm, I, that's why I'm making a separate workspace for each note. Mm -hmm. That way I don't have to delete the layer or something to make a new note. So I can always go back okay, and so redump that sample. The, can you open, are you saying that I can open one workspace without opening the other? Or if I. No, I'm just saying. If I did this all in one workspace, which is this first workspace, to make these loops, I'd have to chop stuff up, right? right, right. And then to make the new node, I'd have to go back and then chop it again. And it'd be difficult to retain all of that data for each node if I was only doing it in one workspace. Okay. So that's why I'm selecting the node and dumping it into a new workspace and doing one at a time. That way, if I do load it in the sample and I realize, now there's something funny about this, I've got to go back and tweak it. I'm not having to start over from scratch. All right, one more. Are you ready? This is the this is the the killer. This was the what was it? The high E or something? High E take three. Yes, high E. Let's see what we end up with here. Edit new layer from no new workspace from selection range. This is my high E. How long is this? Hmm. It definitely evens out right about there, doesn't it? Yeah, the second half of the tail. Alright, well, I'll try to get rid of that first bit then. So, um. I can live with that. And 
And then I need to find a loop somewhere in that even spot. This is really high. This is like the highest note it can play. It's got a little bit of a pulse to it, but I think I can live with it. I can live with it. And you can see what's happening. It's just a little bit louder here than it is at the end of the loop, and that's why you get this little, slight little nudge, but it's all right. You can't do automation, right? Nope. Well, what kind of automation? Level automation. Um, yeah. Yeah, but remember, this is not a fixed timeline. Can you automate the region and not? Yeah, but that's going to mess with your loop. The whole point here is you're making it nonlinear, and the automation is linear. So, I mean, I'm I'm. As long as your automation restores to the same level at the beginning and end of the loop. Yeah, I guess that's tricky though. You can. You could try and do some of that um, and then bounce it out. Um, but you don't know where, the problem with that is you don't know where your loop points are. So if your right. automation is at two different levels, it start and stop at that. Yeah, it's not, this, the solutions to these problems are typically not automation. It's typically just what I'm doing right now, which is editing out the bad stuff, setting up crossfades, and finding a loop that works. But I mean, I'm, I'm I'm actually accepting loops here. I'm not entirely happy with. So be prepared to spend ten minutes or so trying to find a loop. I mean, that's that's you got to get that right, or it it sounds awful later. So right. So spend the time fixing it. Yes. So uh, you know when you spend thousands of dollars on these fancy sample banks and everything, this is what you're paying for. You're paying for somebody who's going to do this for you, okay? I'm just saying you don't have to do it. You can do it yourself. I mean, this is, I'm one of those people that hates paying someone else to do something for me. I'm perfectly capable of doing myself. And I'll quite happily spend the time on it if I have to, you know? So I'm not going to go pay somebody for a recorder sample. I'll just make my own. I do my own on grass. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I fix my own car. <laughs> Pay someone else to do that. All right. Um, all right. I think I got everything. Did I get the high E out here? Yes, I did. All right. So I'm gonna go. I'm done with Triumph now. Now we can go to Logic. How are we doing on time? Oh, plenty. Awesome. Okay. Um, Apparently, I have some control services in here that are messed up. Ah, uh, yes, there's that thing. Give it to that. Okay. Um, now, watch carefully because this is this will be the secret to success or failure. Okay. You have to make a new session. You're gonna put a software instrument in it. Okay. And I'm going to actually put it out to Soundflower so you guys can hear it. What would you do right now? I'm just setting my output device, oh, okay. so the sound card. Okay, and create that track. Now, before you do anything, you're going to save this session. Now, this is the part where you will either succeed or fail. Mm -hmm. This little checkbox. Copy the following files into your project, EXS, Instruments, and Samples. So easy to forget that. Check that box, or make sure it's checked before you save this project, or you will have a heck of a time pulling this sample bank back in. Okay, Logic, there's only one, 
if you, if you call Apple and read their manual and everything, they'll say, oh, there's like five different places you can put these sample patches and it'll load up no problem. Reality is there's only one place you can put it where it will reliably load up for any other project. I'll show you that in a little while. But, um, but if you check that little box, then it will copy it into your session and then it doesn't have to go look for it somewhere else. Now normally this is a waste of space because if you're pulling from uh, you know, the built-in libraries and stuff, it's making copies of those into your session and that's just like unnecessarily adding to the size of your project. So there's a lot of people that'll tell you to turn that off because... I always have mine on. I always wonder why it's so huge. Yeah, and that's why because it's copying. Every time you put a, load an instrument in, it's copying all those samples into your projects instead of pulling it from directly from the library. So if you're worried about file space, you can uncheck that and then you don't have to have that problem. But if you're making your own sample banks, you really should check that box. Otherwise, you may have a hard time pulling your work back in later. But that's just a matter of like relocating them, right? One Every would time. think. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. I believe you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's. Uh, I've seen many a student spend you know hours working on something and they come to me later it's like and we just cannot get it to load for the life of us because they didn't check the box and it's not copied into their session and there's just no way for logic to find it again if we can see the file it's, it exists it's on the computer getting logic to talk to it is like it just won't do it okay you just need to create an auto reply email every time someone emails you like have a list of things and one of them is did you check the box yeah <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to call this my recorder sampler. I'm going to make sure the box is checked, and then I'm going to click, and I'm also going to put this as a folder as opposed to a package. This is another important thing to do. Can you explain the difference again between folder and package? So what a package does is it creates a single little icon that you're going to see in the computer that has all of the data inside of it, but you can't get to it. So if you want to like crack open this thing and just go pull those samples out of there and use it for something else, it's really hard to do that. It's much easier if you make it a folder, and then you have a full folder structure that you can go in and drill down and get at all of the resources from the project. So what's the advantage of that? Why do they even put that on there? For people who have a hard time keeping track of their data. Right? It makes it one file that they can just move around, and they know everything's coming with it. They don't have to worry about all the other folders. It's like an encrypted file. Yeah. yeah. So it's just, but that leads to problems, I found. All right, so I'm going to hit folder. I've checked the box, and we're going to hit save. There we go. Uh, now, uh, I, I'm not going to do it, pull anything from this library, so I'm going to make this go away. I'm making my own. That's the whole point of this, right? So uh, here in my sampler instrument, I'm going to, instead of, I don't want to pull up a preset. I want to just pull up the sampler itself. So I'm going to click on this guy, and I want the EXS24 sampler. Okay. And in this case, you, you know, your options are mono, stereo, multi-output, or 5.1. Uh, depends on what you want, I guess. I'm going to go ahead and say stereo, even though I have mono samples. Um, most of your samples will be mono, but there's some stuff you can do where you could have, like, if you could have, like, the low strings favor the left side and the high strings favor the right side and it gives it a little bit of a spread. You can only do that if it's if you have two channels output. So even though it's mono source, you may still want to do it as a stereo patch. So I'll just do that. Okay, so here it is. Now, uh, the magic button here is this edit button. If you don't see that button, there's another box that you haven't checked. Okay? And I'll show you where that box is. So if you go to the Logic Pro Preferences, go to Preferences, Advanced Tools. So this is one of the things that when they went to Logic Pro 10, they set it up so that by default, when you load it up, it'll look just like GarageBand. Like it is GarageBand. Okay? And they said, well, people who are trying to get into Logic from GarageBand, we want them to feel welcome when they launch Logic. Um, we don't want them to be intimidated by all this extra crap. So they turned it all off. 
Uh, and then they figure the people who know about the extra stuff, they're going to know that it's possible and they'll figure out that there's this box they have to check. So you go to advanced tools and here you go. Now you want to make sure that the advanced editing thing is checked. I just check all of them because I would like to see the whole program. Thank you very much that I paid for. So please show me everything that it can do. Okay, so just check all those boxes and then you'll have an edit button. Okay, so I'm going to click the magic edit button and I get this window that you've probably never seen before. And this is the Logic uh, Sampler Patch Editor window. Okay, so here it is. I'm going to go to this instrument thing and I'm going to make a new instrument. Okay, and then I'm going to save that as something just for fun. Uh, save this as, and I'll go into my, uh, it, it will default to the sampler instruments folder for your project, which is a good place to put it. There's another place you can put it, which is if you want, if you're going to make something that's going to be brilliant and you want to use it for every other project you ever do the rest of your life, you can put it in the lot, the magic logic folder where all that stuff is. And I'll show you that later, but all you really need to do is the EXS file and it'll put it in there. That EXS is the sampler settings. Okay, I'll just save it in the project for now. Okay, there it is. And uh, you can see now it's loaded up there. And now I'm going to put my samples in. So I'm going to go and find all of them. Here they are. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, what, what, what window were they residing in? Oh, just a folder where I had saved them from, okay. from Triumph. So that's wherever you put them. And I'm just going to drag them from the finder into here, okay? And it's going to ask me this thing that seems a little scary. So um, you can do auto map, and what that'll do is it'll try to go, and if you did put that metadata in that tells it what note it is, it'll automatically assign it to that note. I didn't do that, though. So I'm just going to do contiguous zones uh, and let it figure it out, and then I'll sort it out later. Okay. Yeah, auto map. Wait, it's saying that it can determine what note? No, it's saying it'll go in and read that little metadata file that says what note it is, if you put it in there. So if you know all the frequencies, you can just put them in. You can put them in there, and then it'll put it in. I've just found that, I don't know, some people like to do that. I just don't. I, I, I prefer to just put everything in here, but that's just me. So what is contiguous? Zone? Contiguous just like butts them up against each other. Okay, so you'll see, as I click this, it just puts them all in, and it just put them on one note per, at a time, starting at C1, okay? All right, so. Did you, um, also, did you normalize when you went out of the logic before trying? No, I didn't normalize these. Okay. You could if you wanted to. Did you use overprotection? Overload protection? What was the fun effect? I didn't do anything. I just bounced it straight up. Um, if you want to normalize them, you can. Um, I'm just, I didn't for this. Uh, all right, so here's what I'm going to do. I got to figure out what all of these are. So I've got a low C, and I'm going to call that, I think that's probably going to be C3, which will be this one, right? So I'm going to say that's its pitch. And then its range is, I'm just going to start by putting it, oops, let's see, C3. Uh, I may just have to move it. So I'll drag it and move it up here to C3. So now if I hit middle C, there's my C. Ooh, my loop's good. It's playing forever. Excellent. Okay. Um, now uh, I've got a low E, which that'll be E3. I'm guessing. <laughs> Ultimately, it doesn't matter. This is your sampler patch, right? So you can put it in whatever octave you want. Whichever octave makes sense to you, put it in there. It's just Ultimately, it's just whatever note you want to push, whatever key you want to press to get the sound. Okay, It's yours. You can break the rules. All right, so the next one I have is... See, an A, I guess, would be the next one, wouldn't it? Be that one. 
So we're going to call that A3. Now watch what happens. Since I called that A3, if I leave it down here on C1, it plays it at a really low pitch, right? Because I said, well, this is A3, but I want you to play it as though it's C1. So it pitches it down. That's, whole, that's what a sampler does, is it takes this stuff and it pitches it live. Okay? Yeah. That's good. There's a lot you can do with pitch shifting that I'll show you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we'll put that on A. Okay. We're getting somewhere. Um, okay, so now the next one would be my other C. So that'll be C4. And then I'll go ahead and put that up there. A little gap there, doesn't it? I'll fix that in a minute. Okay, um, and then my high E, which will be E4. Yeah, okay, see that one? I got a little gap. So um, here's what I'm going to do. Um, sample. So sample start. So I, so I go to this view menu and I said turn on zone sample and I'm going to have it start in a little bit farther. Um, let's just start at a thousand samples and see what we get. No. I mean I could go back and re-edit it but I just want to show you that you don't have to. Closer. What's that? I'm making this up. This you're, you're making, the number is going up though, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just can't see that though. Yeah, so I'm going, I'm up at 10,000 now. What do you say? A sample is like a bit? So there's like... No, a sample is a sample, right? You have 48,000 of them every second. 48,000 of them every second. Because I'm at 48 kilohertz sampling rate. There we go. Excellent. All right. So uh, now, I, so I've got my four samples here. So what I want to do now is I want to uh, mix them a little bit, get the, their their levels to line up because they're not all the same loudness. And I'll do that with this keyboard here because there's no velocity on this one. This one sound pretty close. That one could probably go just a hair quieter. Yeah. Maybe just the minus oh, one. Couldn't hear that louder anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's louder because the instrument played it louder. Yeah, but we are sensitive to that. Yeah, yeah, we're more, yeah, exactly, we're more sensitive to it. What I'm trying to do is, the whole point of this is to take an instrument that you don't actually know how to play <laughs> and load it up into a keyboard so you can play it. So uh, the fact that, yeah, those notes would naturally be louder to me, that, that's going to annoy me ultimately because I want to just play this on a keyboard. I don't want to have to know that, oh, well, these notes get louder. And if it was a real instrument, I would know that I would, wouldn't have to blow as hard on those, right? Because the instrument would play those eat more easily. But I don't want to have to think about that when I'm on a keyboard. Like, oh, i got to be lighter handed with those higher notes. So I'm just going to make them match. And that one definitely needs to go down a couple dB. Maybe even three. Yeah. See that one. That one's quite a bit. That was like Yeah, I need to tune these now too. Maybe even 
six. Well, you need to know what they are. <laughs> so that's part of the deal is, is pick your handful, however many notes you're going to do, and figure out how to play those notes and know, so you know what they actually are. And then you can say that before you record it. I'm now playing the A. And then you play the A. <laughs> so that later you, you can edit that and put it in. OK, so now i got to tune this sucker. So how do I tune it? Well, um, you need a reference. Okay, um, and what I'm going to do is uh, create a reference, and let's see if I can. Can you can you do it mathematically? Pythagoras is there. Uh... Sure, but there's an easier way. Oh, okay. I remember it was hard to be warned. So. <laughs> Get the payoff, yeah. Um, I thought I had this on here. I must have it on my hard drive. But I'll show you how to make it. I'm just going to make a 440 hertz sine wave. Okay. Uh, I think I can do that in Triumph. Let's see. Process. No, I don't think I can. I'll do it in Logic. So let me just save this instrument here. And I'll close this window out. I'll make myself a new little track, a new little audio track. And I will plug, do a plug in here, test oscillator. Go 440 hertz. Why 440 hertz? Because I know that that is A. <laughs> okay. sound. Okay. Right? So now I'm going to bounce that real quick as a mono file. Uh, no normalizing for now. 440 hertz. And just for good measure, um, I'll go ahead and load that up into Triumph 2 and, and make sure it loops so it doesn't have to hear it clicking all the time. Make myself a new workspace for that. Should we do this with the sound as well? I think you should, if you would like to have all of your notes in tune. <laughs> Let's just see how it loops to begin with. If I actually purple, you can tune this to some back kind of tune. It is. Let's see how this loops all by itself. Yeah, that's awful. That's awful. All right, we'll make a loop. This will be easy to loop, fortunately. because it's just a pure sine wave. There's no harmonics to muck it up. OK. All right, 24-bit. We'll call this our 440 hertz looped. There we go. Now I have it there. Now I can drag it into my sampler. So I'll pull my sampler back up here, hit the little edit button. Now I'm just going to drag this 440 hertz into here. Now I need to tell it what this is. What pitch is this? What is it? A4. A4, right? Oh, A3. 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 Will it be A3? Yes. A3. So I'm going to say A3 because that's, that's what piano's tuned to, right? It, well, all instruments tuned to that A. 
when when they have you ever heard an orchestra tune? All right, so the oboe plays that A, plays this string, so it tunes off of this, yeah. It's more common to most instruments. Uh, yeah. You got open strings on strings, but then woodwinds, you still have less fingers to use in brass. It's a common note. So what now? What I've done because I've told the sampler that that's an A, and I've I have it spanning the entire keyboard. I now have a perfect reference for every note that I can tune against. Okay, so if I start with my C, those are clearly out of tune, right? So my low C, and I'm going to just tune this a little bit. I'm my higher low. Oh, let's find out. There is. You're trying to make it not pulse, right? right? It's out of tune. Let me go back to zero here. I don't think I'm a full semitone off. So that's a zero. Let's go back minus one. I am almost a full semitone off, aren't I? close. I'll keep that for now. Okay. I may go back later. There's my E. So why do I have to do this? Well, if I want to play this against other stuff, right, if I want to use this as the harm, as the melody instrument against some other ones, these other ones are going to be in tune. And my E is not going to sound good with them, right? So I got to tune these so that it sounds right with all the other instruments. sharp again. That's close. All right, we'll keep it for now. All right, there's my A. Close, isn't it? All right. You you could spend all day doing this and never get it perfect. Just. <laughs> Yeah, we could do that. I mean, we could call this. Uh, I could make this A four. Or no, A two. Yeah. 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 Okay, so this will be this guy now.
There we go. All right, now my... Oh no, that was the wrong one. I was doing the C, wasn't I? And now, last one. That's actually pretty good. Excellent. Okay. So, what? So, in reality, what, what the issue probably is is um, the recorder probably plays an octave higher than I mapped it, right? So that's that's why that didn't quite line up. Um, but that's fine. I'll leave it for now. All right. So now, what I can do is I can actually just either get rid of this 440 hertz, or I can just effectively mute it. So I don't want to get rid of it quite yet because I may want it later if I need to go back and tune this more. So I'm just going to take this level and drop it all the way down. Right? So now here's my notes. And now I need to figure out how to range these things. Because I obviously I want more than just those five notes, right? So uh, what I'm going to do, now generally speaking, it's the sampler will sound better when it's pitching things up than it does when it's pitching things down. Okay, that's just a rule of thumb. Pitching up sounds better than down. So I'm, what I'm going to do is ultimately err on the side of going up on all of these. And I won't necessarily go all the way up, but I'll leave it a, a slight gap so there's, it'll, there's at least one step where it goes down. Okay. So there we go. Now I've just really got one semitone between them, and I'll go ahead and then drag the the previous ones down a semitone to get the because ultimately I just want to have full coverage, right, for every note. And then these top ones and bottom ones, I can just drag those all the way because I I'll, I may need to get a lot of mileage out of those. This is the cool other cool thing about samplers is that you can make an instrument play a wider range than it is truly capable of doing. Okay, so now here's here I should have everything now. Now it'll play really low too, right? Because I expand it that far, but I hardly would ever do that. Now I can play chords. <laughs> <laughs> Can you play just up a scale, starting at the very low note? Like this, all the way down here? Just go low. Just go slow. So you can hear it really uh, distorting. Yeah. Or changing. Yeah. yeah, and that's why you. That's why you really want to have you know multiple notes. That's, you know. So how many do you think you need per octave to make it sound? I I I mean you know, like on this one, I ended up with three per octave, basically. I, I tend to not like to ha push it much more than three semitones in either direction, if I can help it. Now, some really, you know, some of the best sounding, like, piano samples, they do one sample per note. You know, and imagine programming that. <laughs> okay. So let's talk through some ways I can finesse this a little bit. Okay, so I've, I've gone ahead and I've saved this for now. Um, now here's where I can get into my traditional synthesis, right? So now I can, for example, if I want to put a little bit of an extra tail on, on this, I can increase the release time. Right? Um, if I let's say if I I can now make now I'll be able to make this the recorder do things that can't actually do like vibrato maybe okay so I could use my LFO you know my LFO one 
See how it's applied to pitch already? That's like a default for the sampler. So, and it's using the modulation wheel to do that. Okay, so I could fine tune that. I think that's maybe a little bit dramatic. I'll, I'll just narrow the range of that a little bit. So right now I can make it actually do a little vibrato, which normally wouldn't, it's hard to do. Um, Um, you know, there's other stuff you could do. You could you could now warp it with a filter and all kinds of. I mean, if I wanted to have the notes fade in a little bit, I could increase the amplitude envelope. Now they ease in a little bit more. Now it makes my playing sound a little bit better. <laughs> so anyway. Um, if you do do any tweaks on that, you need to go into this options thing here and say save settings to instrument. So it'll make sure that whatever controls you do here will get stored with the actual EXS sample file. So when you recall it, you'll get that back. Otherwise, you won't because it's they're separated normally. What, what's the button? So it's options and then save settings to instrument. And it'll just copy it into that instrument file that you've saved. And then watch what happens when I hit save on the project. If you watch carefully, you'll see a little blip will come up. Oh, it was too fast. So if it's a big one, you'll see a little thing come up that says it'll say copying audio. And what it's doing is it's is it's saving those samples to your sample, to your project file. So if you watch, look here now, if I go into my recorder sampler logic thing, there's the EXS sampler file, and it actually has here's my samples. That it's copied into there. So that this way, every time I open this, regardless on the computer I'm on, it will always be there. Now, if you want this to show up everywhere, and for sure everywhere, every time you use it, use this computer, you can copy it to the sample library for this machine. Okay, and to do that, you have to navigate to um, the root directory of your hard drive. Okay, so just Macintosh hard drive. You're going to go to library application support and I believe they've changed it every once in a while I think it's logic yeah and then you can do sampler instruments and here they all are you see I've got a couple that I've done my my dragon and my thunder um, so I can go now over here and I can say all right there's that and I'm gonna just copy it into there um, you can also just put it on your desktop right the no Oh, you can. <laughs> it, that will not behave reliably. That's why. Yeah. I did that, and it's not behaving. Yeah. Um, and then if you want to be, like, super duper sure, what happens is it will load up this EXS file, and then it will go scour your computer to find the samples. So it will just, like, do a spotlight search for those samples, and it will find them at the nearest location. If you want to be... If you, never want, if you want to make sure you don't have to have your hard drive connected or something like that, then you can go ahead and copy the samples, too. So you could say, um, you know, here's my sampler instrument, and I could just go into like my um, EXS factory samples, and I could just copy that into there, and then it'll it looks there first, so it'll find them in there, and it'll be fine. Um, so now what'll happen is, if I uh, close this, now I can make a new project and a new instrument here, and close this. If I then pull up the EXS24 sampler, then if I, oh, it looks like I had to refresh. Refresh the menu, and there's my instrument, my sampler. I, I should have called it recorder, but anyway, but there it is. Now I can use it. Okay. You're making a sound. <laughs> you know, I want. Well, I need to do the next little bit. Yeah, a little bit of more, a bit more reverb would help a lot here. There we go. There you go. I knew 
you do the last little bit again so I can write it down. Mm -hmm. The saving form. Um, oh, to put, make it show up in the menu? Yeah. So you're going to go to just your root directory of your hard drive. All right. You go to library, application support, logic, and then you have this is the you have a bunch of different folders here, uh -huh. and the sampler instruments one is where you want to put that EXS file. <coughs> and if you want it to like show up in its own subfolder, you could just make a folder called you know my cool sample library, right? And then it'll show up in the menu as a contextual thing, right? I've just got it in the root. And so you copy the EXS file there, and then if you want to be double sure, you can go to this EXS factory samples folder and put your samples in there. EXS factory, and then just drag them in, right? Yeah, drag, so just drag the folder full of the WAV files into there. And then, you'll, and then, you'll, and then it'll pull up any time in any session. Okay. Now, Apple will tell you there's other folders you can put it in. Nope. Doesn't work. <laughs> well, it works sometimes, but not all the time, I found. This is the only surefire bet to have it show up everywhere. OK? All right, there you go. So um, what we're going to do Friday is I have another one I've done, which is a guitar, an acoustic guitar. And what's interesting about that is an acoustic guitar sounds different depending on how hard you pluck the string. So it will show you how you can actually create layers for each note so it'll play a different sample depending on how hard you press the key. Okay, So that's what we'll do on Friday. But for now, start thinking about an instrument that you want to make. So something that either you know how to play or somebody you know knows how to play. Uh, and you can take them into our studio there or record it at home or whatever, but you want to record them playing you know, a handful of notes on that instrument or yourself playing a handful of notes on an instrument. Uh, and then you'll make your own library with it. Okay. I want to do one on water drops. I want to pitch water drops. Yeah, that'd be cool. So I have to get, I guess, different glasses for, yeah. for pitches. Okay. Yep, you'd have to get, you know, five or six different pitches, I would think. Okay. And then, yeah, you could then shift them around. Is there like a thing like just like uh, key checker? I don't know. You play it, and it tells you what note you're playing. Like, you don't know what note it's now. Uh, yes. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Let me show you. Hold on. Uh,